Charleston County budget, to affordable housing, to infrastructure. Those are some of the issues that Charleston County Councilman Dr. Kylo Middleton is tackling. I talk one-on-one -on -one with the Councilman for this edition of Quentin's Close-Ups. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel and like Quentin's Close-Ups on Facebook. Charleston County Council Member Dr. Kylo Middleton, welcome back to Quentin's Close-Ups. Very good to be back, Quentin. Oh, I appreciate it greatly. As you know, Charleston County Council just passed a budget for the next year that comes with a raise for property taxes to some areas within the county. As we sit here right now, Rev, what are those areas in the county that actually can raise taxes for, you know, the county right now? Well, some of the uh, tax raises went to in areas that had special purpose districts, areas that uh, had special fire districts, those type uh, areas that required uh, additional millage to um, attend to the functions of those uh, services that are being provided sp specifically, excuse me, in those areas. And so uh, that's why they are experiencing a tax increase and not countywide. We were very uh, resolute uh, and, and, and heartened that the uh, millage remained flat, you know, for the entire county. So the tax uh, raises were not, um, you know, levied on every citizen in, in Charleston County, but certainly for those special districts uh, that required special services, um, again, it's fair and uh, appropriate uh, for them to uh, receive that increase. So before the increase, Rev, what was the millage rate for these special purpose districts? Now, Quentin, I don't have that information right in front of me. If, if, if I had these questions in advance, I would be able to tell you specifically. I'm not even in my actual office at this time, so I don't have uh, those, um, those specific numbers. I don't, I don't even have the budget document with me. Uh, but if you go to the county's website, you would be able to see, you know, the old budget numbers and the new budget numbers. Uh, to ascertain the increase in those mills. So again, uh, need for very special services like fire protection, yes, special services like, you know, in special service districts uh, that they have unique, you know, um, uh, services that are being provided by the county that in order to upgrade, you know, the services in rural areas like trash pickups or recycling, that sort of thing that comes to their house uh, those types of services and conveniences you know they are you know being increased and in paying uh, additional fees for that but you can go to the county's website you can uh, you know view the entire budget in, in its approved form uh there yes sir so let me ask you this uh Rev, and okay so how much money does the county or that special purpose uh, tax district expect to make in the in the next couple of years with this so I am not the county treasurer or auditor, and certainly with the um, our deputy chief of finance, I don't have any of those projections or um, figures in front of me right now. And certainly, I can't even do that math on my calculator <laughs> at, to that to that level of specificity. Um, surely, we have had um, great gains uh, in the past so, so this budget uh we had surpluses we we did have um you know increases or we made money let me say it that way to the extent that we were able to you know anticipate uh, areas to give raises and to increase uh, different areas, you know, within our county, you know, as it relates to our staff and uh, valuable employees. And so those things were able to happen uh, because we did find money uh, that uh, existed, especially as you look, look at taxes uh, from delinquent taxes and or from um, those individuals who are buying homes in this area, the Register of Deeds office, you know, explosive market. And so, so, so we are receiving, you know, um, remarkable, you know, uh, um, surpluses in, in certain areas, and those areas are able to um, budgetarily allow us to provide uh, additional uh, benefits to our employees. And I want to get to that in just a second, Rev, but you say that you all found money. Where else did you found money to actually, you know, help with this budget? So again, when I say find money, when 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 the market, the Charleston market is so explosive, you know, when you look at uh, the housing market, and that's why it's so important to have affordable housing, uh, work workforce housing, attainable housing, because when you look at the explosive 
uh, housing market, you know, when individuals close on these houses, you know, the county makes money, you know, and, and that's just the way it works. And so uh, they have to file, you know, those uh, register those deeds and they have to file uh, certain uh, taxes and, 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 and property taxes, that sort of thing associated with their homes. And the county does make money off of that. This is a good place to live. And uh, Charleston County is an explosive growing county. And certainly as a result, uh, there are uh, opportunities uh, that come, you know, back to the county as a result of that. Uh, Charleston County is also a hospital, the number one, you know, Charleston, uh, everybody comes to Charleston, right? So our accommodations taxes, those are another area of, um, uh, of revenue that we continue to see increases, you know, because people are coming here, they're spending money here, they are enjoying our area, our region, uh, to include, you know, Berkeley and Dorchester counties, all, you know, one Charleston, one region, and so people are coming here and they're spending money here and when they spend money here again we benefit and we're able to do a maximum amount of good uh, by providing additional services uh, to um, Charleston County residents. So from 2022 to right now Rev what was the accommodation tax uh, revenue for this uh, county? So again uh, Quentin I don't have those figures in front of me because you know you're ask asking for specific numbers from a budget we, we made millions, right? And so, you know, again, the accommodations tax um, income, you know, is recorded and the expenditures, you know, certainly we, you know, expend out uh, to certain municipalities, to our economic development, well, not through accommodations taxes, but there, there are certain funds based on, you know, those sources, uh, including accommodations taxes that the county approves for special uses, uh, also including going back to certain municipalities that levied, you know, um, based on, you know, where these monies were made, uh, they are also paid, you know, they, they get some money back. And, and we did add, I, I remember, $250,000 to a certain community uh, agencies, groups, and organizations uh, that can also benefit you know, from those type funds. But uh, the accommodations tax breakdown uh, is included on the county website uh, as a part of the Acadaso to the county budget. And so all of those numbers are transparent. Those numbers are there and you can see the disbursements thereof. Well, let me ask you this, Rev. Is the growth in residential and personal property values expected to moderate over time? I don't see that. You know, again, this is why we continue to fight for, you know, some, you know, uh, parity, uh, equity and, 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 and just justice in, in, the, in, in affordable housing. Because when you look at the nature of even uh, renters, you know, when this market explodes and increases, rent skyrocket and, and that, uh, the, the savings, even if there are some, are not going to the renter, they're coming to the property owner. Uh, and the rents continue to soar and get higher and higher and higher. And so we have to, at some point, and, and we have a real opportunity. We have our housing, our future plan. We have a plan. We're rolling that out. Uh, council is unanimous, and we've uh, learned that through uh, just legislation that was passed by the state that we can now also use accommodations taxes uh, for uh, tax revenue for affordable housing, some percentage thereof, uh, for uh, affordable housing. So we plan to do that, and that over time will quell uh, the, our, our, our curb at least the, um, the inflated uh, rates of these rising skyrocketing uh, housing rent cost per uh, household, you know, that individuals uh, find themselves living. And so over time, I think with the intervention and the uh, introduction of our affordable housing um, plan, which contemplates our ability to add so, so much affordable workforce attainable housing products to the market that potentially, so we don't know yet, right? You have to get it in the market first before knowing how that is going to, over time, quell uh, these astronomical um, rising costs 
in our region. It's not just Charleston. It's also Berkeley County is exploding in growth, right? It's one of the fastest growing regions in the nation, not, not just Charleston uh, County, uh, not just the Charleston, um, Berkeley, Dorchester uh, area, but in the nation. And so when you look at our region, people are moving here and that's a good thing, but we need to find ways to uh, make certain that when they move here, they can live here and work here and they can afford to do so without, you know, in, in, without impacting their livability. So let me back it up, Rev. I have to do this. <laughs> but what is the typical rent cost in your district? So, you know, again, West Ashley, right? You know, my district uh, spans from South Windermere oh, into yeah. West Ashley. You know, I live off of, off of Beast Ferry Road. I have uh, now in my new district, after redistricting, still North Charleston from roughly Leeds Avenue uh, up to Bosch, you know, the plant maybe in that area. Okay. If you think about, you know, just where the district is. Yeah. So even looking at District 6, but all of Charleston County, because we serve the whole county, right? I mean, rent costs could be anywhere from, you know, $1,500, uh, you know, to $4,000, $4,500, depending on where in the district or where in the county uh, you're looking to find a place to rent or lease. It is truly um, out of it is out of control. And so I don't know of teachers or first responders, um, individuals who are earnestly working, I mean, they, they, who are working diligently to support their families who can continue to afford those type of, um, those type of living uh, expenses, you know, to be able to, um, you know, live comfortably, as we call it, and, and, and to be able to thrive uh, in the area in which they live. So, so I think that it is the overarching responsibility of county gov government and municipal governments and just government period uh, to make certain that we do not uh, outprice these areas where people can't live in the same area that they work. So let me ask you this too, Rev, then. So how many renters do you have in your district and how many owner homeowners do you actually have? So, Quentin, do you think I have a clue? I don't know exactly how many. I, oh, e no even, worries. No worries. Even, I'm just got to do my job. Well, I mean, I don't know the exact number. And if I had the questions ahead of time, I could have researched, right? I'm not going to just, you know, um, suppose or throw fictitious numbers out there just to say, uh, make it seem like I know. I don't know because every day I see new <laughs> complexes going up every, every single day. And some of these places that are going up are not necessarily rent, you know, for rent. They're condominiums. So people have to buy into uh, those uh, they look like apartments but they're condos and people have to buy into those and or lease long-term uh, leases so I don't know if those numbers are dynamics but I can tell you I have a lot of people living in my district because you know all of these places are occupied and full and uh, I don't see any of these uh, new developments that are going up that are housing um, apartment units or you know townhome units or you know garden home type uh, stop all of them are being occupied by people I could see something go in the market even in my own neighborhood uh, for sale one day and close the next. And so these, it, it is just district, district six particularly, uh, but certainly all of Charleston County that I'm speaking of generally, it, there is no desert where you have, you know, empty houses and people, neighborhoods that have been abandoned and ghost towns. Uh, every place within my district, at least, and certainly from one you know expanse of Charleston County to the next, I see people living in these homes um, and trying to enjoy the life that you know God has afforded them. Well, let me ask you this, then: How many new homes have been built at a fairly consistent rate over the past six months? So again, I, I can't give you you know quantitatively a okay. specific number i can tell you based on my you know riding my bicycle walking <laughs> uh, through my neighborhood driving you know throughout charleston county i see home i, I could go to a to an area just like right now on the beast ferry road uh, you know they clear trees I, I turn around and then houses are up. And so, you know, again, developments are shooting up daily. I, you know, in where I live now, I lived in Grand Oaks previously, but I built a house 
um, you know, right around the corner. And, and I remember going where it was just a vacant area and, and my house came up, you know, overnight. So, I mean, these, these developers are building these houses uh, and I know mine is structurally sound, let me tell you. And so they're doing a good job in their developing their, their development. And so, you know, houses, the, the housing market in Charleston is a booming market. And so uh, they're, they're putting these houses up quickly in order to, at, with, good construction, you know, quality uh, in order to meet the housing demands of the area. And infill development is what's happening that, that I'm seeing where areas I, I like, I moved out, you know, I, I used to call it the country, you know, as it relates to, you know, where I live off of Beast Ferry Road. It used to be more rural and feel, you know, although it was still the city of Charleston. Yeah. And I appreciated that. And, and certainly I'm from downtown Charleston, as you know, and, and I love downtown and my church is downtown and surely I love coming downtown and I've grown up downtown and on the peninsula and, and, and certainly wish that uh, there were more affordable opportunities there as well. And I also appreciated driving away from the peninsula and driving into, you know, my area where I live now because it used to be a whole lot more uh, of a rural feel, although you had the urban, you know, tangential access. But now I go home and I'm like inundated. All the infill development, I don't necessarily, I, I don't think I moved out there in order to have everything grow up around me, but it's what's happening. So I, I may as well get over it because there's nothing that I will be able to do to stop that uh, at this rate now. So is infill development good for your district? So again, I, I have been resolute, and I'll say that again from the time that I've been on council. I ran, right. uh, you know, you know, for smart growth and and very strategic development. Sure. Uh, so in some cases, I think infill development is appropriate, good, and 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 works. And so in on the peninsula, I would think that everything needs to be infill. It needs to go up. It needs to be dense uh, because again, there's no more real estate. There are other areas that that it does not make sense uh, where we have not put in uh, the infrastructure necessary to be able to really handle uh, the infill development because you still have to look at storm water, you still have to look at us flood, you have to look at so many other um, uh, unintended consequences from the infield development, uh, particularly as we have not really addressed any of the road issues to include widening them and, 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 and you know, making them more accessible for, you know, egress, ingress, Re egress, you know, getting in and out of these communities. Uh, and, and so even where I live, you know, the new, very new development is one way in and one way out. And so at some point there may be another way, but not yet. And so we have to recognize that when uh, some people are trapped, you know, if there's a major storm, a hurricane, if there's a natural disaster, uh, you know, especially with the flooding uh, capabilities of, of some of these communities, uh, it, it becomes almost like a fishbowl. So we have to make sure that even in the midst of infill development, that we're doing all of the infrastructure work around those developments to support it. So what infrastructure is being developed around your district now? So again, we have commercial, you know, uh, development. So when we talk about, you know, things that are being products that are coming online, we have commercial, right. residential right. developments going on all around. So, you know, fortunately over in, in, in district six or, you know, on this side of the county, you know, we have widening projects. We have road projects. Projects happening around the district of the Folly Road corridor. Uh, we have projects going on there on the 61 Glen McConnell end of the corridor. We have projects going on there on the um, Bees Ferry Road and the main uh, roads, um, Savannah Highway. So there, there are a lot of um, infrastructure improvements going on in in my area. And so, uh, you know, again, you know, Councilman Rawl and others uh, before me were extremely. Uh, they had great foresight and. And, and they and, and 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 they you know lobbied and championed those type things that needed to happen, and so I think that I'm inheriting, and some of which I've also um, you know been on the front lines as I've been a council person uh, taking leadership, uh, but. Uh, 
I think this part of the district is in good shape. We still have places like 40, 41. We still have places like Mount Pleasant. We still have places uh, up, uh, you know, going toward the low part of my district, going toward uh, Latson Road and Lincolnville and those places that, that really still need um, infrastructure improvements. I think with the low country a rapid bus transit system. Some of that will be touched, you know, through that uh, project. And, uh, you know, um, again, as we continue to recognize that with more development, we also need infrastructure road improvement. I, I think the county is a little bit more fo focused on uh, making those things happen. So how much money is in the budget for these current infrastructure projects? So again, Quentin, you're asking me, you know, specific dollar numbers, go to the county budget and look at all of these infrastructure, you know, there, there's a whole area that talks about, um, you know, roads, infrastructure, um, planning and zoning, public works, all of those type projects are wrapped into some of those departments. And, and you can see, you know, line item or budgetarily, uh, I don't have that, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm in a remote area. So I don't, I do not have access. If you told me we were, you know, what we were talking about today, I would have had my budget book and I could turn through a page and I can give you a specific number. But in this context, I cannot, the budget is voluminous. It is like this big. So I, I, I can't know every figure without having some pre, um, you know, idea as to if you wanted to know, I would have brought that number to you. Oh, I know you want. I know you wanted to specifically talk about county council. Yeah. But let me ask you this: How are these projects consistent with the community's development? Meaning the infrastructure projects? Yes, sir. They are consistent. So I'm very concerned because, again, you know, I, my heart continues to lean, you know, toward, um, you know, I had a red top community association meeting on um, Tuesday of this week. I met with them on Tuesday. And, and Red Top, you know, has been left behind for so many years as it relates to infrastructure improvement, um, looking at flooding in their community, something as simple as, you know, cleaning out their ditches, right, uh, and fixing their roads. So since I have taken over that district, uh, or they have become a part of my district because they were, you know, previously not, and since, you know, they have been, we have been dogged in working with county staff and making certain that all of those and I'm happy to report that um, that those projects are online and moving full steam ahead and by 2024 uh, should be completed. And so talking about um, the Hughes Road outfall, looking at um, roads, road projects uh, within Red, uh, Red Top, that um, Downing Lane, um, Hughes Road, all of the connected uh, areas that need to be improved in order to uh, help mitigate their flooding situation, looking at drainage, uh, taking, you know, drainage Meetings down lines, you know, from certain areas so that they can flow out uh, properly and, and make certain that these communities don't continue to flood and individuals, uh, that, you know, they have rivers and lakes uh, flowing all around them. So I'm very proud of that. Looking, you know, across the county at, uh, you know, places like 41 and uh, the Phillips community. So again, these are historic communities that uh, are African American and it doesn't matter if they're African American or not. Uh, I think that when we look at areas like where I live, you know, all of that is baked in the cake. So when, when they're building these planned developments, uh, all of the infrastructure needs and, and, and mitigations are done. I, I, where I live, I don't have any flooding issues. I don't have any of these other issues that some of these communities have. I, I told you I can't get in or out except one way, but, you know, again, that's I shouldn't even complain about that, right? Because that's not really a big problem. But when you look at, you know, contemplating a road project on 41, three lane versus five lane, and the five lane then comes up to my front door, I think I would have a, a big concern about that. And so I, I'm continuously watching, and, and I know that's coming, coming back before council, but I wanna make certain that even as we're uh, improving infrastructure in certain area, that areas that we know that we need to have improved, because that 41 corridor, Clements Ferry Road right. corridor, Berkeley County is exploding all tangentially uh, alongside us. And so all of those need to be um, uh, improved. And at the same token, it can't be improved on the backs of, uh, on the backs of citizens and, and those uh, particularly who have been there so long uh, historically in these communities, these sediment communities. But we have to find um, a, a consensus that enables us to 
um, help them, as I said earlier, maintain the integrity of their community because some people move out to rural areas on purpose. I mean, I like trees. I like to see nature. I like land. I, I like, um, you know, the, the environment. And so I don't want to see, you know, concrete, you know, and or asphalt uh, everywhere I turn around and especially looking out my front door. I would not want that, you know, sort of, you know, traffic, you know, literally right in, in my front door. So, so I'm, I'm extremely sensitive uh, to improving in infrastructure, but not on the backs of uh, communities that um, will be negatively impacted. So what's the consensus about 41? Should it be three or five? Well, there is no consensus, and again, we will talk about that. So, you know, again, I'm talking now to you, right? So I'm I telling you it. my feelings, and, I and, and I will caucus with my council colleagues. Now, we've been doing real well this year uh, on council in the sense Herb Sass is doing a ph ph phenomenal job as our chair, and um, and I, I think there's a, a, a collegial vibe on council because we've been able to uh, work in harmony. I can say that, you know, in, in with with assurance and, and, and we have agreed, you know, not, you know, unanimously on every little thing, but certainly uh, on the big items, you know, facing the county, we have moved a lot of things forward on our county agenda this year, much more so than ever before. Uh, we've been, you know, stymied, we've been stalled, we've been divided, uh, but I, I really feel a sense of, you know, uh, 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 let me see how to phrase this. I, I, I feel a sense of forward movement, let me say it that way, uh, that I have not felt before. And so um, to know now how the rest of my council colleagues will react to a three versus five lane option, I have not discussed that with them. I'm discussing it with you, but I will be discussing it with them before it comes before us so that I can have a sense and I can give a perspective because sometimes when we talk one-on-one, -on -one, uh, that may, may you know, sway some people based on uh, just understanding contextually uh, in a different way when explained how these, in these things impact uh, the lives of individuals as opposed to just checking off for the sake of saying that, oh, we improved that road and then not knowing the collateral damage or the unintended consequences and the real life impact that would have. So I don't know, you know, if the appetite is for three or five, uh, but I'm feeling three, you know, because five kind of encroaches too much into the um, front doors or into the property lines of, you know, some of those on 41. But um, that's just what I'm feeling right now. So what would be the consequences if they were to vote for approve five? So they've done that before. And, you know, certainly, um, as I said, we're, we're more unified now. So I don't look at things on party lines like, uh, you know, they have, you know, this group has a majority, that group is a minority. Um, I don't look at it that way, um, especially on these type projects. I, I just think that it, it, it whatever um, the appeal would be, would have to be making a case where the county itself, you know, is doing based on the purpose and need of the project is meeting that purpose and need. And we are extremely, um, sensitive to these vulnerable communities. So that, that would be my only layer that I, I think that would have to be, um, considered, you know, beyond just, you know, somebody presenting a scope of work and, and not truly considering, you know, the complexities confronting the community. So I, I think that um, anything can happen uh, because I, I wouldn't say, well, oh, because a certain, you know, political group may have a majority. I, I've seen great uh, consensus across, across uh, political lines. And, and I think that we will continue in that kind of spirit. And I hate to be redundant and silly about this, but what would be the unintended consequences if you pick three? So again, if we pick three, then you have less, you know, the road, I guess they would say would fail, you know, because when you look at the, the, the traffic study, so that's what's driving it, the three versus five. And so three, they would say over time, based on, you know, the purpose and need and the traffic um, flow and, and, and based on all of the other connecting roads, that that road would fail. And so by saying that it would fail does not necessarily 
it, it would not fail to those that it does not encroach their front door, you know, that would be a win, right? But it would fail as it relates to the amount of cars and the traffic congestion over time based on the length of how, however these things are projected out, um, how, how the road would would be able to handle that traffic. So, so five would probably be more desirable because it would then, for the bang for the buck over time, allow for more use and allow for more traffic uh, to flow in a better way. And so, whereas that is feasible and that, that certainly sounds um, logical, uh, it, it, the unintended consequence would be that the people who live there would suffer. So let me ask you this, Rev. Then, so how many cars actually travel that part of Highway 41 every day? So, Quentin, you're asking me, you know, these specific numbers. You know, we've done traffic studies. If you go on the county's website for this 41 project, they will have a, a, a whole, you know, a report of, uh, of the number of cars based on each scenario that's being presented, you know, how that would alleviate you know the traffic congestion based on the number of cars even projected based on those who are moving here uh, they have a, a number you know that's projected for that as well and the number of cars also that may uh, be added as a result of you know just the growth um, you know all of that is on the county website I don't have those numbers but if you go and look at that study it's there so I, and please don't get mad at me <laughs> I'm just trying to get some clarity for the viewers but let me ask you this then so how many people actually move in there per year? In well, I, don't know, I don't know how many people are moving to, um, you know, Mount Pleasant area, uh, Huge Wando, because that would be, that's the corridor that would be most affected. Okay. But I do know that, you know, the, uh, based on what I heard, the last numbers, like 50 some odd individuals are moving to this region every day. And so with 50 some odd individuals moving to the region every day, and even if they're not moving yeah. uh, to those areas, people are working, you know, people who live in Mount Pleasant or live in Phillips community or live in Oakland, right. they're working somewhere, so they're traveling. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. A grandfather named after him. His name was Cain Baldwin, and the whole area is named after him. And Baldwin's Corner, my family is from there. Who would have ever thought that Cain Hoy would come into play? But as a part of the expansion and growth in Berkeley County, Cain Hoy is now a bedroom community to, you know, to Daniel Island and you know, subsequently to Mount Pleasant. So all of these areas are growing. Clemens Ferry Road is being widened in, in that sort of so, so, so 41 would have to, you know, uh, also, um, you know, be uh, considered, you know, because all the growth that's happening in that area. And then, of course, when you look at 17 over in that area, yes, it's all connected. Right. And so that's why, you know, this 526 project also will become important. And I want to talk to you about that in another time. But let me ask you, uh, Rev. Okay, going back to your district. So what areas right now, as far as roads, should be widened in your mind? So again, you know, we serve the whole county. So we, yes, I, know, I know we run from districts. So I want people to stop thinking about your district, your district, because once we're elected, we're serving the entire county and we're serving, you know, specifically our districts, but we're serving the whole county. So somebody can call me, you know, from McClellanville and I have to go there. I have to attend to and work with their council person too. But yeah, surely we, we were all, all, all over the place. So in, 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 in District 6, if you're looking at the boundaries, the parameters of District 6, yes, sir. Actually, when you look at road projects, so some road projects are state road projects, so it's uh, DOT. It has nothing to do with us, but we have to get in the mix of that as well. Some are municipal road projects, so some are the city of Charleston, North Charleston, the city, the town of Mount Pleasant. Some of these things are, you know, can operate by the town. And so I think that when you're talking about clarity, that, you know, residents 
have to understand that it is not the county's function only, you know, to maintain these roads. The county only maintains roads, really, uh, in, in the unincorporated area and where we assist uh, these municipalities and DOT. And, you know, there's a lot of, you know, sort of inner agreements that go along there. And so you, you find us there. But right now, Beast Ferry Road, uh, Glen McConnell, those are good shape. Uh, Highway 61 still needs, you know, some consideration. We're looking at uh, Savannah the highway. That's right. a part. You see all of the bottleneck occurring with that, but we're still working uh, toward all of those ends. We're looking at um, Dorchester Road. You know, that's a part of my district as well. You know, again, state, municipal, all of these inner, you know, governmental kind of things coming together, but you're asking roads by name, and even though whether we maintain them or not, I'm just calling the names of those that need to be touched in some way. And so Dorchester Road is another, uh, you know, main artery that needs some consideration but then also you have to look at some of these secondary roads because when when, when traffic is congested on 26 or 526 and people are trying to navigate right. around traffic, right. and then they're going into the arteries and now these areas have become extremely important and now need also uh, to be considered and so we have our transportation sales tax right. that enables us to do lots of road widening uh, or road work or projects and, and each of our districts um if you want to talk specifically about districts, uh, are allotted uh, road improvement projects based on, you know, if you go to the transportation sales tax uh, component of the uh, website, you'll see all of those road projects that are underway right now. Yes, sir. And I, I got a few Never minutes, did. yeah, two minutes left, uh, Rev. But let me ask you, going back to your district, you talked about infill development. So I, I just want to ask this, is it appropriate and good for your district, though? So some areas, uh, again, I say yes, in some areas, infill development is good and the infill development would make sense. And we, we have to have the appropriate infrastructure. You just can't infill without making sure that you don't, that storm water and drainage and all of these other things are not also mitigated along with the infill development. There are some areas where infill development makes good sense uh, and works, especially those areas that are along this uh, low country bus rapid transit system, which is not pr uh, primarily in my district. You know, that's kind of like coming down Rivers Avenue, you know, whatever. But, you know, those areas, very infill, dense, you know, build, up, build them up, you know, because, again, it's along, you know, the sort of corridor that would enable people to uh, be able to thrive in those areas because you can have shops, you can have restaurants, you can have workplaces, and, and uh, they can jump on that rapid transit, and they can go anywhere, you know, from Somerville all the way down to the peninsula. And so, you know, it makes sense in certain areas. In other areas, I think we need to leave it alone. And, and, and Rev, going back to, oh, obviously, as you talked about earlier, too, the widening. So Savannah Highway, how would you widen that? Would you use the same, you know, method with Highway 41 and Savannah Highway? So we, you know, Avondale um, has been, you know, we, we've been extremely uh, sensitive to the historicity and the in the very, you know, unique quality of certain areas as it relates to going down Savannah Highway. Um, there's some widening, or some, when I say widening, not widening, but some traffic um, improvements occurring now as it relates to some, um, like, um, when you get down to Wapu Road, oh, yes. DuPont, oh, yes. going down to Stinson, sure. uh, and, and those areas where that Captain D's or whatever, some of those are not even aligned where you look straight across. It's right. kind of, and right. so they're making those improvements. Um, those improvements have been approved and they're online and they're coming uh, soon. But when you get to the lower end of Savannah Highway, uh, where Avondale is and closer to um, to the bridge right. and Yield Ash and Ice Cream, we, we have a lot of, um, nuances that are being considered and so the city and county were working together with the community right. in order to um, mitigate some of those. What would be ideal right now for th that area, those nuances? So signalizing the traffic signal to make certain, you know, that 
you're not stopped, you know, every two seconds going that because you've got a lot of traffic traffic lights on Savannah Highway, right? And so we, we learned that, you know, as it relates to engineering, that may not have been the best idea when that when that was uh, put up. And so they're working on, you know, kind of signal signalizing and improving, you know, that dynamic of uh, the traffic flow on Savannah Highway. And, um, and then aligning those intersections where, because it, it people, I think we had one person that was um, killed last year or yeah, that earlier this year, I, I believe it happened, uh, walking across that street coming from where the Harris Teeter parking lot uh, is coming over to uh, Magnolia area. But, you know, so we have to make sure that those areas are safe. People are able to cross, uh, push a button and stop traffic. Uh, and, and so signalizing those lights, aligning those intersections, and improving the flow of traffic, that would be a good place to start. Reverend Kyle Middleton, thank you for your time on Quentin's Close Ups. Thank you very much, Quentin.